The fastest way to remember chapter 43 is base it on the functions of the liver. <clears throat> so let's do four major functions. So what, what does your liver do for you? Okay, so drug and food metabolism. Okay, so what does metabolism mean? Okay, so change it, right? So basically destroying it and then changing it to another form that can be used by the body safely. Okay, so that applies to drugs, food, including beverages like uh, alcohol, for instance. So that's what your liver does for you. Okay, what, uh, what else? <clears throat> what are the other services provided by your liver? Bile, bile. bile production. Okay, so first metabolism, and then next is bile production. So bile is produced by the liver stored in the gallbladder. Okay, so the production of the bile is from the liver. So that's second. Number three, what else? It promotes or it produces coagulation factors. Okay. So therefore, if the liver stops working, what happens to clotting factor production? So you're prone to bleeding. Okay. Number four, what else does it do, do for you? Yeah, so we said detoxification metabolism, drug metabolism, so that's the same. So um, metabolism, uh, next was the, what was the second one? A bile production and clotting factors and then what about albumin <clears throat> okay albumin synthesis is done by the liver so therefore the fluid status that we enjoy now that uh, water stays in the cells some water stays in the bloodstream some water stays in between cells and blood vessels we owe that to the albumin levels. So as long as albumin levels are normal, then uh, fluids stay where they should be because of the osmotic pressure applied by albumin. <clears throat> Wherever you put albumin, water always follows it, okay? Because it's a big molecule. So it has an osmotic pressure. <clears throat> it applies osmotic pressure, so therefore it attracts water. What else? Based on the... <clears throat> um, um, its position. So where is the liver located? Okay, so it's right on your upper right upper quad, right? So right upper quad. So it's the last organ that the inferior vena cava passes. So we call the, the, the largest vessel there is called the portal vein. So that is the last peripheral vein before it becomes the inferior vena cava, right? So it's the last major... Uh, peripheral blood vessel, and then it connects and becomes the larger inferior vena cava. Okay. So we talked about uh, clotting, <clears throat> uh, metabolism, uh, nutrition, as far as... Um, it also takes part in fat uh, metabolism as well, together with the pancreas. That's where bile comes in. Okay, <clears throat> So let's go now to... The disorder. <clears throat> I'll skip all these. Go straight to okay. Liver tests because this is what we need to see uh, to to evaluate kidney fun. I mean, uh, liver function to see what drugs are doing to it. If it can handle, if the patient's liver can handle drugs, uh, because anything you put into your mouth has to be metabolized by the liver, whether that's drug, alcohol, or uh, whatever. Uh, drugs you're putting into your body, the liver takes care of all those. <clears throat> so since the liver does these, there are two indicators of liver function. There are two liver, liver enzymes. So we have <clears throat> A, uh, AST and yeah. ALT. Okay. So AST and ALT. So it's responsible for the following. Again, so for uh, bile production, meaning it will take part also in, in uh, circulating dead red blood cells. So when the red blood cells reach the end of their lives, nothing is wasted. We recycle them. So Billy and Ruben are, are uh, separated. And then the uh, Ruben is the one that's responsible for the... <clears throat> um, 
uh, brown color of your stool and then the other is responsible for the yellow color of your urine. <clears throat> So nothing is wasted in the body. It's all recycled. So here's AST, AL, uh, ALT. <clears throat> Another is a biopsy. So let's say the patient has a tense, uh, some tumor, for instance, growing. So we can perform a liver biopsy. Now, what's a complication with this procedure? Because we're, you've all seen liver liver meat, right? You've seen it. What does it look and feel like? And what color is it? It's not brown. It's dark red, right? Yes, yeah, very dark red. Yeah, so, so and, and it's squishy, right? Okay, so what's giving it that color? Blood vessels. So it's very vascular. So therefore, what will happen if you stick a needle into this very red vascular organ? Bleeding. So most complication, most common complication are the following. So not only bleeding, but it could also be <clears throat> uh, peritonitis. Okay? But between the two, it's more because we, we use sterile equipment though. So peritonitis is not likely, uh, but uh, bleeding is very likely because of this very vascular organ. Um, for the levels on your exam, so let's say I use this for one of your um, NGN questions. Uh, don't worry because you'll be given the normal ranges anyway. So I'll give you, there will always be three, no, four columns. So the blood test, the patient's result, and then the patient's, no, three, three columns, and then the patient's results. But you will now get the normal ranges <clears throat> so all you you only have one thing to do interpret whether the results are high or low so here's the bleeding time again all of these will be provided for you <clears throat> why is bleeding time significant in examining the liver okay because of the coagulation factors um uh, this is the other one we forgot to mention. It's also responsible for synthesizing cholesterol. So it's proper man management of, of fat. Uh, what does the liver do again with excess sugar? So whenever we ate, turn it into fat okay, with the help of insulin, of course. So does insulin make you fat? Yes, it does. Okay, because without insulin, will sugar turn into fat? No, that's why what happens to diabetics with no insulin? Hyperglycemia, they go into DKA. Okay. So again, does insulin make you fat? Yes, it does. Professor, somewhere you see a lot of diabetics. <laughs> I'm not diabetic though. <laughs> not yet. Uh, pre, pre diabetic. I'm pre diabetic. Okay, let's go now to the uh liver diseases we'll talk about don't worry about the encephalopathy this will all be covered in the next pages because these are all complications uh of um liver disease uh they're mentioned here uh let me just mention a few since they're mentioned on this page so manifestations of liver disease are jaundice what is jaundice it's clear right skin sclera and skin so the whites of your eyes and your skin will turn yellow and what happens to your urine color okay dark actually it's not yellow because yellow urine's already yellow okay so in this case it will turn like uh, tea tea colored like dark tea almost like uh coca-cola or pepsi in that color Portal hypertension. Now, what did we say earlier? What's the uh, position of the liver as far as circulation goes? Okay, it's the last major organ. It contains the last peripheral vein before becoming the inferior vena cava. Now, what happens if the liver is, uh, let's go back again. Let's imagine the liver tissue. If you put that on the grill, just one minute on each side, what will happen to it? Is it still red and squishy? What happens to it? 
it's now dry and it will contract, right? It will harden. So imagine the blood vessels in it. So blood is supposed to, blood from the GI tract, starting from the esophagus and all the way down to your toes. All that blood has to drain into the portal vein before it can reach the inferior vena cava. So if you, if you cook the liver, which is what we do when we drink alcohol, abuse drugs, for instance, what will happen to that circulation, to that venous drainage? Okay, there will be congestion in there. So can that reach, can that lead to portal hypertension? Okay, and then the consequences will be endless. We'll talk about all of those. Uh, so just briefly, ascites is what? Fluid in the, okay, uh, excess fluid in the peritoneum. So in, in between your abdominal organs, the stomach, spleen, the large and small bowels, Yes, we have fluid there, but only minimal, right? Only for shock absorption purposes and lubrication. Now, if you have excess fluid in there, enlarging your abdominal cavity, we call that ascites. Now, where did that water come from as a result of this? So let's review again in heart failure. So why did the patient with heart failure have pulmonary edema? Why did they have pedal edema? Congestion. So is there congestion here with portal hypertension? Okay. So therefore, with when the portal veins and all other veins in the in the liver become congested, so what will they do? Also, leak water out. And where will the water go? Into the peritoneum, causing ascites. Okay. Depending on the amount of the water here will determine whether or not they need intervention. So now if the water is, let's say, 500, 1,000, 2,000 ml now, what, what do you think will the patient feel? We can imagine what they look like, of course, like a big yeah. belly, right? Yeah. Or like nine months pregnant. So what will happen now to the diaphragm uh, contraction? What will happen to the patient's breathing and ventilation? So when do you think these patients will go seek help? when they can't breathe anymore it's very hard to breathe they're already standing still can't breathe more so if they're laying down so they'll come to the hospital and get a what do we call that procedure again wherein we drain okay paracentesis now briefly again varices so these are like varicose veins you've seen varicose veins correct in the leg have you seen varicose veins in the esophagus Okay, so let's look at the picture of esophageal varices. <clears throat> so imagine these are uh, varicose veins, but they're in the esophagus. The, the problem here is it's not in the outer surface of the esophagus, it's inside. Here. See where the varices are? Are they on the surface, on the outer surface of the esophagus? No, they're inside, right here, inside the walls of the esophagus, where you swallow, where food, beverage, you know, you're eating, let's say, noodles, you're eating tacos, uh, whatever you're eating, they go inside through the esophagus, right? With, through peristalsis. And then if you eat anything sharp, anything hard, what, what can they do to these already distended? It, it, it will bleed, right? It can tear and bleed. So therefore, since all patients with liver disease have this, so what should always be assessed whenever you admit someone with liver cirrhosis? Bleeding. You always watch them for esophageal bleeding. Will the bleeding be visible? No, they have no idea. They're already bleeding inside. So what will be your manifestations? What you, will you monitor? If they vomit, yeah, you'll see uh, either coffee ground or bright red uh, or dark red blood because this is um, arterial or venous bleed. It's venous bleed. So of course the blood won't be bright red. But what if they don't vomit yet? 
they're already bleeding inside. So what will be early manifestations? Skin. No, no, hypotension. Hypotension and? Tachycardia. All right, very good. Don't forget. So this will be the same GI bleed we discussed in peptic ulcer disease. Okay, this time just caused by something else, but the same exact. GI bleed. Of course, the interventions will be slightly different because this is in a different location. This is in the esophagus. <clears throat> Can they aspirate? And then, of course, they're malnourished now because can you still uh, synthesize the fat-soluble vitamins you if you yeah. can't metabolize fat very well? No. Okay, so you'll be, um, you'll be malnourished um, you'll be deficient in A, D, E, and K vitamins, uh, and, uh, among other things. Plus, your albumin also is very low. So we already talked about jaundice. Now, let's do a patient-centered care. How, how and where do you observe for jaundice in dark skin patients? Uh, inside yeah. of the yeah. It is. Inside of the it is. Okay, so look for an area of the body that looks the same among all ethnic groups. Which are they? The lips all look the same, regardless of your skin color, right? Meaning areas in the body that don't have pigments, okay? What about the soles of your feet or the palms? Okay, so those are, doesn't have pigments, right? Or very less, uh, less pigments for the, compared to the rest of the body. So the eyes, the mucous membrane all look the same. I won't uh, distinguish whether what the type of jaundice is because this is just meaning how did the jaundice um, develop? Okay, so that's the only difference here between hemolytic jaundice, hepatocellular jaundice, or obstructive jaundice. Doesn't matter though because the manifestations still look sure. the same. Your urine looks the same, skin and the sclera will look the same. All right, let's discuss uh, portal hypertension. <clears throat> so now if the portal vein is so distended because you have a cirrhotic liver, so what happens to blood return? Venous return. Decrease, so therefore what happens to blood pressure? So cirrhosis, cirrhotic liver patients, do they have hypotension or hypertension? Hypo or hyper? Hypo. Okay. They may look hyper because of the edema. Okay. So let's look at a patient who has liver cirrhosis. So this is what they look like. So regardless of the ethnicity, regardless of the skin color, all liver cirrhosis patients look the same. If you put them in a ward, let's say a, a room with four or six beds, they look like they're all siblings. Okay, They will look the same. The abdomen is so big like this. And the Extremities, uh, only the arms though are slender because the lower extremities will be edematous because of you know, dependent edema. Um, and they all look yellow, right? Here, amarillo, right? Very, very yellow. So the rest of it, um, because everything is backed up, so you can imagine there is esophageal varices, right? It's guaranteed there has to be varices once you have portal hypertension. In addition to that, the patient will also have, uh, besides the varices and the ascites, there will be what we call hepatorenal syndrome. There will be kidney damage as well. Okay? This is now a consequence though of liver cirrhosis, meaning the diseased liver causes kidney failure. Here's the ascites. So what will this do now to the peristalsis? 
because you have so much water in between the abdominal organs in between them so what happens to peristaltic activity as a result bms would be yeah they'll be constipated so bowel movements will be slowed and what happens now to the if that water there stays too long what will the patient develop infection what do we call that now so if that peritonitis this time it's called uh, spontaneous okay so this is now spontaneous bacterial peritonitis just because there's fluid there sitting idle okay? unlike the rest of the fluids in the body where do we have fluids in our body that is always stagnant no even the fluid in the eyeball are these stagnant no, they're constantly produced and drained. So same thing with all other fluids. Pleural fluid is like that. So it's constantly produced and drained. Peritoneal fluid is also produced and drained. Card uh, pericardial fluid, same thing. And joints also, nothing is, is stagnant. Okay. So this one, this fluid here, is this flowing? No, this is stagnant. So can this develop into an infection? Yes, sir. So just a question is um <clears throat> so even sterile fluid, sterile spaces, they if they stay too long, long, yeah, because they're because we have normal flora, right? Even inside our body. So that's what really causes the infection. Because now they overgrow, because now they have a larger medium. Okay. Like have you seen uh, like the uh, parasitesis? When you remove the fluid, it literally builds back up like this. Well, depends. It doesn't really fill that fast. I mean, of course, the the production is not that fast. I mean, the patient's peritonitis, I mean, sorry, ascites didn't occur overnight. Okay? Yeah, it's gradual every day. So yes, that's correct, but not really that fast. Okay, so it will fill, right? Some people in a late stage of ascites, I mean, of uh, cirrhosis, they come for parasynthesis every week sometimes twice a week so it's fast but not really like That's this fast okay the management for ascites are the following <clears throat> now the because the patient has low albumin does that mean we're going to increase um protein intake Yes or no? Oh, it's, it's, it's a part of the Okay. So theoretically, the short answer is yes, we should. However, however, what's the byproduct of protein metabolism? BUN and creatinine, right? So, so BUN is blood urea nitrogen. So the more your protein intake, the higher your... BUN production will be, right? The, the higher the waste products. Now, in this case, though, because the patient now has a lot of uh, waste products because of poor uh, metabolism, both food and drug metabolism is poor. So what happens to ammonia levels here? Will be high. That's what you call, if you saw the first page earlier, it mentioned encephalopathy hepatic encephalopathy so that's now accumulation of high levels of ammonia basically turning the patient into a psychotic individual hey, they go crazy because of brain poisoning by ammonia it's ammonia poisoning basically right right so so in in especially at that stage already so now you, your patient needs protein. However, the more protein you give, then the higher the ammonia levels, which your body cannot get rid of. So that's the hard part of managing uh, that stage of cirrhosis already. Okay. So yes, the short answer, of course, we need to give the patient protein, but we are now restricted if the patient's what levels are high? Ammonia. Okay, so ammonia will ammonia levels will limit how much protein you can give a patient, which happens down the road, okay, uh, in the later stages of cirrhosis. 
So these patients basically are malnourished, correct? It's the, the proof there is the albumin level. So the lower your albumin, then the more malnourished a person becomes. Can you read this for me? Table salt, salty food, salted butter, and not urine, and all canned and frozen foods that are not specifically prepared for low sodium, sodium diet should be avoided. Okay, you should know that, right? Uh, and so, therefore, what can we use uh, safe uh, salt substitutes? Okay, the following. Okay, so that's okay. At least your patient's appetite will um, will be stimulated because they need to eat. <clears throat> Do we use commercial salt substitutes? What did you learn last semester under heart failure? Okay, these are made of potassium. So once the patient has liver cirrhosis, now we uh, institute salt restrictions already, two grams sodium. Drug therapy. <clears throat> so how do we address ascites? Okay, there are many options here. One is diuretics to promote fluid loss. We can the doctor decides which one. So spironolactone will do what? It will potassium, potassium sparing. However, if we use this, what will happen to potassium levels? Okay. So although this one helps with sodium loss, however, it will also increase potassium. And remember, these patients, the later the stage, also develops hepatorenal syndrome, which is basically chronic kidney disease. So the doctor decides which one to use. Your responsibility is, of course, depend it will depend on which drug is used. So we have uh, the diuretics mentioned here are spironolactone, furosemide, and acetal acetazolamide. Um, <clears throat> well, this one is contraindicated, sorry. Uh, fluid restriction only if the sodium levels are very low. Otherwise, remember, these patients are hypotensive, okay? Now, remember also in when we talked about ARDS, so how did ARDS uh, lead to uh, pulmonary edema again? Leaking. Leaking. So, uh, because, but the leaking is because of what happened to the capillary walls? Highly permeable, okay? All right. Here, though, let's look at the albumin levels of the patient. So, therefore, plasma proteins are high, low, or normal in cirrhosis patients? Low. So, therefore, if the albumin level is low in the plasma, what will happen to the water in the plasma? It will go out. So, therefore, can this contribute to the edema? Is this water inside the cell? Is it outside the blood vessels? Yes, they're outside the blood vessels. So our fluids, our water is supposed to be where in our body? Either inside the cell or inside the blood vessels. Only very small amount should be in between. So here, where is this water now when we have ascites? They're not inside the cell, neither are they inside the blood vessel. So therefore, are they contributing to any cellular or body processes? That's they're good. useless, right? They're in, in this, right? They're in a third space, which is useless. So therefore, is it beneficial to put the patient on fluid restriction? Uh -huh. No, because they need fluids, okay? Because this fluid here cannot stay in the plasma because albumin is low. And again, we can be restricted with protein intake because of ammonia levels. So, so far, we haven't gone through the whole thing yet. So is it good to have liver cirrhosis? How many livers do we have? How many lobes? Good thing we had three lobes, though. So you can destroy one or donate another, for instance. Okay. But we only have one liver. So here are the possible complications when your patient now starts presenting with ascites. So we've got electrolyte imbalances and because of ammonia levels, the patient now has encephalopathy. 
So there's mental status changes here. So they'll be combative. They don't know you anymore as family members. You may introduce yourself at the start of the shift and they were appearing cooperative. You and They recognize you, but then later mental status change and then they'll become combative. They'll start punching you. Or it can go either way. The patient with encephalopathy, they may have uh, mental status changes, but then the, the level of consciousness may also decrease, leading to coma. They could go into coma. Uh, they're always put on bed rest because the demands, the energy demands uh, caused by normal activity, can they supply that? No, these patients are severely malnourished, so we put them on bed rest. Let's talk about the varices. Now, remember, what caused all of these? So far, we've talked about portal hypertension, ascites, esophageal viruses. What happened? What caused all of these? What triggered? The liver cirrhosis. So the liver failure is causing all of these problems. Okay. So, so far, uh, we've talked about ascites, portal hypertension. Are these minor problems? No. How many organs failed here? Only one. Look at the consequences of losing your liver. Okay, so we've done portal hypertension so far. Now we finish ascites and management. Now let's go to the varices. 30% to 60% of cirrhotic patients have cirrhosis. Okay, so that's high. So can we assume it every time we have a liver cirrhosis patient? until we get we 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 confirm that they have no no uh, uh, varices we assume every patient with cirrhosis has varices okay so what's the number one concern once you have these varices again bleeding, bleeding. okay so they're very prone to rupture causing massive hemorrhage so the bleeding can be upper and i, I mean can be seen upper or lower so what's the evidence again of uh if the, it goes out the other way dark. no this way would be vomiting so what dark. will be okay dark what do we call that again harry okay so what's the medical term for that melina, melina. <clears throat> not all of these will rupture especially of course if you find them sooner we can manage it. Can we give the patient beta blockers for varices? Yeah, because yeah. varices uh, are blood vessels, so they're, therefore, can they respond to visodilators like beta blockers? Yeah. Okay. So we can put them on beta blockers, and then later we'll go to, when we get to medical management, we'll see medications to decrease the likelihood of bleeding, and then, of course, surgical uh, management is important. <clears throat> Patients surviving the first episode of variceal bleeding are at very high risk for recurrent bleeding. Because now, because once a portion of the varices rupture, that means, is it bad? Is it limited to that one portion? That Okay, so that means the rest of it are also prone to rupture. Patient may not die from the, from the cirrhosis, but can they die from the ruptured Esophageal varices. So what uh, caused it to develop is, remember, it's the congestion in the portal vein, correct? So when once the hepatic portal vein is congested, that means all the blood will back up, not only in your legs, but also in the entire GI tract. And the number one concern, of course, is the esophageal varices that form. Here's your management of ascites, uh, there'll be a separate chart for the paracentesis because paracentesis can be done at the bedside. That means you're the one assisting the physician. You're the one preparing the patient for the procedure and then taking care of the patient after the procedure as well. So for the patient living at home, you tell them to weigh daily okay, and then report a significant uh, weight changes, that means they're retaining more water. 
and INO. Uh, of course, at this point, all um, Escardas, uh, except in my family, <clears throat> we really don't have, um, well, not anymore. <clears throat> okay. We really don't have alcoholics in my family. But all the other Escardas, because Escarda is my mother's um, maiden, maiden name. <clears throat> so all these Escardas, um, so those will be my uncles, cousins in my mother's side. They all die from cirrhosis. Didn't matter whether it was my female or male cousin, they all died from cirrhosis. Okay, so I've seen encephalopathy. I've seen, because I remember growing up a little bit when I visit them, like my uncle Pedro. Hey, uncle Pedro. And then I saw my cousin Benjamin, cousin William. Hey, he died just like, you know, he died just like uncle Pedro. <clears throat> so they all look the same. They all died. They had different stories though of how they became alcoholics. Um, each one's unique. Hey, but um, it was amazing. They all died from the same thing. Yes. The weight change that you report is is there a specific number or the same weight? Uh, what like did what we, did, we the, did for heart failure? Heart failure? About okay. the same. Okay. Say what? Oh, like is does the same protocol like same scale? Like yeah, same okay. with uh weight uh man weight monitoring, same thing. All right, let's go to uh, of course manifestations of bleeding is what again? You, you mentioned the vital signs changes, and will it automatically trigger the uh, sympathetic nervous system? Yes. Okay, so in, in addition to that, there of course will be cool, clammy skin, okay, in addition to uh, decreased urine output, et cetera. Okay, all evidence of sympathetic stimulation. Diagnostic tests, of course, we will need. How do you know they have um, varices? Okay, either endoscopy or ultrasound. Can we see it ultrasound also? Yes. So either endoscopy, EGD, or ultrasound. Once identified, the varices will have to be monitored to make sure it's not getting any bigger. Because although we put the patient on beta blocker therapy to control the growth, uh, mean, meaning we're trying to manage portal hypertension basically, to decrease because the portal hypertension directly um, leads to the to the formation of the esophageal varices. So therefore, beta blocker therapy controls the portal hypertension, thereby indirectly controlling the esophageal varices. <clears throat> uh, what are your responsibilities when sending the patient for endoscopy? NPO for how long? Huh? Twenty four hours. Come on. Uh, 12? I can't stand. Okay, six to eight hours. Okay. Uh, I won't do the portal hypertension me measurements because we're not doing this. The doctor does the measurement, so we'll skip that part. Let's go to management now. So patient has cirrhosis, therefore has portal hypertension, and as a result, they have esophageal varices now. Okay, so how do we manage it? Depending on the status, is it ruptured or not yet? I'll skip the part when, where it's ruptured, because of course, if it's ruptured, is the patient having GI bleed? So therefore, what did we do with peptic ulcer disease management of GI bleeding? What's the priority? Fluids. Fluids first, and then followed by? <laughs> Electrolytes or the um, blood? Blood products, right? Yeah, so fluids first, main, uh, maintain blood pressure, and then we start giving blood trans transfusions. And you said we're going to give... PPIs, okay, so yeah. PPIs will help. And then there's another drug here we use for stopping the bleeding. 
uh, octreotide. You're probably not familiar with the generic, so the uh, brand name is Sandostatin. Have you heard that in clinical? You should because there's so many alcoholics in city hospitals. You're bound to have taken care of one, yes. right? Because you, you guys are usually on med surge, right? Yes. Yeah, there's plenty there, almost. So this is a drug for GI bleed, or I mean for esophageal bleeding purposes, this is given continuous IV infusion. Okay, it'll be a slow uh, infusion. So this will decrease bleeding from esophageal varices. Another use for this drug is also for, you've seen people with ileostomies that have so much liquid stool. Okay, this can also help uh, slow down the stool uh, in, in uh, ileostomy patients, basically, you know, for diarrhea. But for esophageal uh, varices patients to decrease the bleeding, we give them octreotide on a continuous IV infusion. So this is pre preferred treatment regimen for immediately controlling esophageal varices, uh, varices bleeding. Another is, what's it, vasopressin? A, we saw this in shock. So what is this? A? No, that's desmopressin. This is vasopressin. So this is? Vaso means? So it's a vasopressor. So what is this doing? A, vaso constrictor. A. All right. Okay. I already mentioned beta blockers, so this will help control again portal hypertension. Okay. Uh, take note: this is not given for hypertension because is is portal hypertension the same as hypertension? No, this is just the pressure inside the liver. Because remember, these patients overall have what blood pressure? Is it high or low? A high pole because of volume depletion. For acute bleeding, wherein the patient is actively bleeding, so this is an invasive uh, procedure, but it is a rescue um, procedure. <clears throat> so this will be, let me show you the size of the tube used for this. So let's say you're your nurses, so some of you will uh, go on to be nurse practitioners. So let's say you go into critical care um, nurse practitioner. So you'll be inserting these. <clears throat> so this is a rescue procedure. Now this is not exaggerated. This is full scale. Okay, so look at the size of the head and then the size of the tube. It's literally this big. Okay, it's not a, um, no, this is accurate. Okay, this is an accurate illustration. Look at the size of this tube. Put through your nose, down your throat, and then there are two balloons here. One in the esophagus itself to stop the bleeding. So this will be inflated and it will compress the, the uh, bleeding uh, vessels. And then this one, because there are bleeding vessels here as well because the esophageal varices can extend into the anthrum of the stomach. And then this, this larger balloon will hold it in place, plus also put pressure on other possibly bleeding uh, varices here at the base. Okay, so what's your concern if you have this in your patient? Because this can be in place for 24 to 36 hours. Look at it, it's a huge tube. Okay, breathing would be an issue, so they'll have to breathe through their mouth, and then what else could, could possibly happen? Can they swallow? Okay, they cannot swallow. Okay, because can, how can you swallow? There's a huge tube in your, in your throat, right? You can breathe, but then, the, so the trachea is here, but then can you swallow? No. No, so are you at risk for aspiration? Okay, so make sure they must be 
NPL. So this is what you all have to look forward to. If you, you know, choose to live a life of drinking. Right? So this is this procedure is used for to stop the bleeding? Yeah, acute esophageal uh, bleeding. Okay. So all my cousins had this, my uncles. Okay. So they all underwent this one. And... Um, yeah, and of course, if there's a doctor in the family, what do they tend to do? Yeah, call that. So my brother had to do all of these for them. Oh, you now? Gee, William just came here last week. Yeah. So they were brothers, Benjamin, William, and then also a set, another set of brothers. I don't really know my cousin's full na real names because I just called them, you know, their nicknames, Tote, Baby, No, No. <laughs> Mario, I don't even know what their real names were. Huh? No, it's not genetic. They're, they're all alcoholics. They just like it. Alcoholics. <laughs> Again, just you know, different stories, right? I say just briefly, okay, a few seconds. Uh, William uh, started drinking because his wife was he loves his wife very much. So even if she was. Uh, sleeping with other men sometimes in their own home yeah he, he he loves her that much okay yeah so of course he's not home okay he's you know out working and then the the neighbors are telling him you know hey and then he, he loves he just he just loves her so much so he just drowned himself yeah and if you only saw what um I'm not not to say anything okay? if you, if he knew what um his wife was Linda he knew only knew what Linda looked like so Linda was no not Linda Lydia her name was Lydia <clears throat> exactly yeah that was blind that's <clears> crazy <throat> Okay, uh, so aspiration is a concern, both for the uh, the vomiting episodes plus when we put in the uh, the Sungstaken Blakemore tube. Okay, so when we put in this tube, uh, it, it's, you know, putting the patient double uh, whammy now for aspiration. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, technically, uh, we go by the textbook. So for the textbook, for the EG, we call it esophagogastro, no, esophagogastric balloon tamponade. It's 12 hours, but in, you know, in, uh, in most settings, I mean, because this bleeding can extend too long, so it can be 24 hours, uh, up to 24 hours. Wait, so um, balloon tamp, just call it balloon tampon. But the procedure is because it's you know inserted through the esophagus, so it's esophagogastric balloon tamponade. <clears throat> so here's your Cusin warning alert, safety alert for patients with the uh, EG balloon. Another option is if it's not bleeding yet, or if the bleeding is minor, we can do endoscopic sclerotherapy. You familiar with how they treat varicose veins? They inject what? A sclerotic agent. I don't know the name, but they inject something into the vein, destroying it. Okay. So this is uh, the um, what's done in the esophageal varices. So are these done for larger or smaller varices? Smaller. Okay. So if it's small, they're not bleeding, or the bleeding's minor, then they can do this procedure. Another is ligation. What is ligation? Okay, so just like tubes, for instance, you know, when you have birth control, so you tie your fallopian tubes. So this is another option. So you can uh, tie your uh, bleeding uh, varices. Uh, sometimes you can also do uh, banding. So they literally put a band. So let's say this, you know what sausages look like, right? So let's say there's uh, 
this is a varices, a varices. Okay, so they'll put a band around the varices so that it doesn't get any bigger. Can you picture that? Okay, so that's what we call banding. Okay, we can also do banding. <clears throat> and as mentioned earlier, we can do PPI during acute bleeding. So PPI or H2 receptor blocker therapy along with the octreotide. Don't forget the octreotide uh, infusion. Okay, let's go to TIPS. <clears throat> TIPS is a last resort. Okay, again, what is this? Yeah, okay, sure. we do not do TIPS at the so first sign of uh, severe ascites or esophageal varices. This is only what? Okay. Last resort. Because the problem here, so last resort, so if the patient has uh, variceal bleeding or recurrent ascites, not successfully treated with other interventions. So now we'll have to resort to TIPS. Now, why is it a last resort? Let me, uh, not really. It's, it's going to uh, make, it's going to make the encephalopathy worse because liver tissue, the, Good and bad thing about liver, the liver organ is it's very resilient. No matter how diseased it is, as long as there are living cells inside it, it will work. It won't work normally, but it, it'll still work. Okay. Unlike heart, wherein you know it's or kidneys, for instance, 10% left, basically useless. This one, even if it's five or 10% functioning, it will function. Okay? It will still get rid of ammonia. The problem with this shunt is if we put a shunt, meaning we bypass the portal vessels, we connect the shunt straight into the inferior vena cava, totally bypassing the liver organ at all, meaning because of the portal hypertension. So what you're doing is from the this vessel right here, you're allowing the blood to bypass liver tissue, go straight to the inferior vena cava. So therefore, is this blood passing through any liver cell? So are is the liver cell, are, are the liver, the remaining liver cells, are they still metabolizing and cleaning that blood? Absolutely not. So what will happen to ammonia levels? Nice. It's gonna get worse, okay? So again, why is this a last resort? it'll make what worse? The encephalopathy. So therefore, again, we tried everything, nothing, it, it's the, the, the condition is advancing. So now the doctor will recommend tips. Usually this is when the patients already have uh, a few years to live or maybe a few months. So let's do tips, okay, just to make them comfortable so that they don't have to repeatedly come for paracentesis. They don't have to uh, suffer esophageal variceal bleeding. Okay? So no, no, you know, less ascites, less uh, esophageal uh, bleeding, but they will have more encephalopathy, okay? which we can still treat. That will be on the next page. So these are the other complications besides encephalopathy get worsening. Patients will also have bleeding, sepsis, heart failure, organ perforation. So again, is this a first um, choice? A okay. last resort because of these potential complications, including the encephalopathy. Uh, surgery, of course, is to um, surgically stop the bleeding, or let's say if it resulted in um, uh, you know, necrosis or destruction of the esophagus, then they'll do other surgical procedures as necessary. Uh, we'll skip the bypass. This is not really very popular. Okay, nursing responsibilities. Watch for signs and symptoms of bleeding. Administer medications as ordered. 
Um, you may be ordered to give vitamin K therapy as well to decrease the bleeding times, decrease the uh, PTINR. <laughs> I won't. No, sorry. Uh, this is a summary, table 43-2. This will summarize your nursing res responsibilities with each treatment. So for beta blocker therapy, including the vasopressor therapy, these are your nursing interventions. Balloon tamponade, again, look, at, look for aspiration or prevent aspiration. Uh, tips for rebleeding, and then what's the consequence of tips again? Of the uh, encephalopathy. So monitor what levels? Ammonia levels. With hepat hepatic encephalopathy and coma, so these patients are already intubated at this point because if they're in a coma, can they still protect their airway? No. So they'll be intubated. And the here's the pathophysiology, basically accumulation of ammonia in the blood, which will destroy, literally destroy brain tissue. This is a common sign of, this is in stage three. So when your patient has stage three encephalopathy, they will, uh, we call this asterixis. This is the term for flapping tremors. So there are many terms here, flapping tremors, liver, tra liver flap. So what happens is you have the patient um, raise their arms like this. And unlike you, wherein you can hold it steady, the patients will do this. Okay. So this is caused by irritation of the nerves. Okay, caused by ammonia. So that's asterixis. And they'll, their breath literally smells like the S word. <coughs> we call that fetor uh, hepaticus. Uh, don't believe what they're saying here is freshly mowed grass, acetone, old wine. No, it smells like poop, okay? <laughs> smells like poop. <laughs> Smells nothing like mold grass. <laughs> uh, management of encephalopathy is, um, you've heard of lactulose? Yes. Yeah. What does lactulose look like? Oh, it's like, it's like Ashley? That is zero. You've never seen it? Zero. Yeah, it comes in a, like a jello yeah. container. Zero. Okay, it's orange. A okay, thick orange liquid. Have you ever tasted it? No. Okay. So it's given to Okay. How does it lower ammonia levels? Okay, it acts by trapping it and expelling it in the feces. So therefore, the more lactulose you give, the more bowel movements the patient will have, which is what we want. Now, the goal is two to three stools per day. Yes, technically. But this time, plus the patients also are constipated anyway, right? Because of the ascites. Okay, so what's your goal here? So the, the order will not say the frequency of the lactulose. It'll just say lactulose. And then on the specifics of the order, to produce two to three, do we want loose or form stools? It's SOM, we want soft. We don't want the patient diarrhea because this will further um, uh, worsen the hypotension and the um, low, def no, the fluid deficiency. So we just want two or three soft stools per day. Okay, so therefore, how many lactulose will you give? However many it takes to produce, two to three soft tools. But don't worry, it's, it's very effective, okay? So after one, usually they get uh, one or two, but you want two or three. So maybe more than one dose, right? So maybe two doses. I've never really had to give three. Two, usually, uh, even sometimes after two, I get diarrhea already, so I'll stop. 
I mean, not me, the, the patient. So here's your warning because of that again. So just watch, okay? And be patient. Don't give it and then, oh, nothing. And then don't give another one in the next five minutes, okay? So give it a couple hours to work. Uh, and then this one also it's it's not sweet, okay? It's um I've never had a patient say it's sweet. Uh it's weird. It's a weird, weird taste. So you can mask it with let's say juice or uh, you know, any drink that has no sodium, you know, okay, so you can't give soda because that's high in sodium. If they cannot tolerate it. But we need to give it, so the doctor may order for it to given to be given through a nasogastric tube. At least they won't taste it, okay? Because it's really important. Because how else can they get rid of ammonia? There's no liver functioning. There's no functioning liver. So the only way is through lactulose. So you have to give the lactulose. Again, what's your responsibility if you can't give it by mouth? Patient won't take it. Okay, so call the doctor. You may have to give it by nasogastric tube. Okay, other uh, interventions. If let's say absolutely the patient refuses, no NG tube, because you know patients will refuse, right? So then no NG tubes, they can't take lactulose, then it'll be non-absorbable vitamins, such as neomycin, Flagyl or metronidazole, rifaximin. So these are non-absorbable vitamins. Okay, so you give it by mouth. Um, this will help eliminate ammonia. And for patients with encephalopathy, what do you monitor? Here are your responsibilities. So very important is the protein intake to watch the patient's protein intake. Yes, we need the patient to have protein because otherwise, how else can you have tissue repair or uh, fluid balance, right? So you need to control the levels, though, based on the ammonia levels of the patient. Because the higher the protein, the more ammonia you produce. With these patients, do we have a lot of options as far as pain medications or any other drug therapy for that matter? Because on top of this, can the patient also be diabetic? Yeah, they can also have liver failure. I mean, a kidney failure, heart failure. Who knows? COPD. So therefore, the more drugs the patient gets, the more what to deliver? The more damage to deliver. So this will limit our uh, pharmacologic um, choices, okay? So with, with managing the patient's other comorbidities. So here's your nutritional management. So avoid, this will include medications because are medications considered toxins also? Basically. Uh, so this is now with encephalopathy, okay? So if there's no encephalopathy, can we give the patient liberal amounts of protein? Yes, by all means. However, once you have encephalopathy, cause, of course, what's causing the encephalopathy? The yeah. ammonia. So therefore, can you limit the, must you limit the protein now? Yes. Okay. So you're now down to 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilograms per day. Again, so this, I already said this, no protein except, okay. So the best way to give the protein would be um, you know, spaced out through the day, you know, little bits at a time. That way you have less uh, ammonia. I'm not testing the next table, which is the stages of encephalopathy. We're not really responsible for that. Your resp our responsibility is to make sure these patients remain safe because what's your concern when you've had patients with encephalopathy already? It's confusion, right? Acute confusion, so they're always prone to falls, okay, injuring themselves or others. So it's always about safety. 
So if they're at home, you know, fa family members should be taught, you know, that they have these aggressive tendencies. You no, know, tell them it's not the patient doing that. It's the encephalopathy making them do it. I said, uh, skip table 43-3. We already talked about edema and bleeding. What's causing the edema here? Low albumin. What vitamin uh, what vitamin deficiencies will be present? Just remember a deck. Okay, a deck. Yeah. So here, I'm not testing these, just nice to know. Uh, let's say here for scurvy, okay, vitamin C deficiency, uh, neuropathy for vitamin B, et cetera. Proritus. <clears throat> it's not normal. I mean, it's not uncommon. These patients will have frequent, remember kidney failure? In between dialysis sessions, what do they develop on the skin as well? Uremic frost, okay, so waste products coming out, right, through the skin. Same thing for these people. Um, skin care for this will be what? What do you think? It's very dry, itchy. Warm or cold water? Cold, not too cold. No, you would give them warm because it's cold. Uh, let's go to the um, nursing okay, to make sure. Uh, I think it's in the end, toward the end, sorry. Uh, so we'll skip that for now. But the, yeah, it's be, it'll be um, lukewarm, okay? Uh, no, the proper term is tepid. Chris, tepid? Yeah, tepid? Yeah, tepid, tepid uh, temperature water. Okay, let's go to hepatitis and then that's it. How many hepatitis do we have? A, B, C, D, E. Okay, most yeah. common are the those five, A, B, C, D, and E. Okay. The only questions here is the patient has the hepatitis. So when they're hospitalized or at home, what's your concern? Um, Besides that, because is this going to damage the liver as well? Yeah. Yes. So in addition to what we already discussed for, let's say, protein, etc., will this patient also be con con contagious? Yes. yes. Okay, because this is a virus. So what do we need to know? So um, Bubakar asked me earlier about hepatitis B. So what precautions do we institute? What's your answer? Standard. Standard. Why standard? Hepatitis B. Why standard? Okay, to answer the question, look at how is it spread. Okay, so how is it spread? So let's look at it one at a time because that's on your blueprint. It says mode of transmission. So therefore, when you know the mode of transmission, does it tell you how to prevent it? Yes. So let's begin with A. You have a table. 3043-4. So A is um how is it? Right, sorry. Um nature outcome. Uh, this is not helpful. <laughs> um, uh, let's try the next page maybe um, ah okay so it talks about a H H1 okay sorry because <clears throat> it's different from the 14th edition <laughs> okay sorry so hepatitis A how do you get it right here so therefore it's since it's caused by con consuming contaminated food and water so what will be your precautions? Your food no, no, no. I mean, precautions, you know, let's say this patient's admitted in the hospital. So it's, it's oral fecal route. Is it droplet? Not droplet, no. but like... Or, Do you put them on contact? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes, because any body fluids, including saliva and feces, contain the virus. Okay. So that's it. So what's your precaution for this? Okay. And then what do you tell them to do with uh, prevention? Let's say you're traveling. Okay, we'll get to the vaccines later. So let's focus for let's complete the uh, prevention. So what do you tell the patients to do? They're traveling. Okay, wash your hands and the food also. The food, okay. All right. Yeah, of course you wash your hands after doing your business. Okay, <laughs> okay this is an important question. Can you get this through sexual activity? No. Taylor, why? How? No, go ahead. That's correct. Yes, the answer is yes. Through oral sex. Okay. So oral sex, because when you have oral sex, are there microscopic fecal material there? Yes, there are microscopic fecal. You don't see it, but there are. I mean, look at the female anatomy. What's how much is the distance between the anus and the and the urethra and the vagina? Not much. Very few centimeters. Okay. So will there be fecal contamination there? Yes. Okay. So hepatitis during hepatitis infection, because this is not forever. Should there be any physical, I mean uh, sexual activity? No. Can you have protected sexual activity? Yes, yes but yeah. no oral. No oral, no oral sex stuff. There's no condom for the mouth. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, That's right. I mean, there's no. Oh. But that won't be on the antlax anyway. Yeah? <clears throat> okay, let's go to the um, vaccination. Hepatitis A has a vaccine. <clears throat> so when should you, let's say you have you're traveling. So how when should you get your first um read the details, okay? Because I will copy and paste the options here. Let's say I put this on a so here, for instance, your vaccination and who are, let's say I go. Who are advised to be vaccinated against hepatitis A? So your answers will be, okay, MSM, and then IB drug users, daycare center staff, those who work in research or animal care settings. If you cannot complete the series, let's say, let's say the uh, the trip to Mexico is only good for the next two days. So can you complete the series? No. No time. So you have the option to. Okay. Immunoglobulin injections are available. So you get that and then you can travel safely. But you still need your first dose and then complete it as um, as as ordered okay complete the series uh, but again your immunoglobulin will uh, protect you um, instantly okay. so here this is not really uh, necessary as long as the patient observe and the people around them these people here observe uh, infection control there's really no need to vaccinate uh, people around them, okay, including your co-workers. So this patient is sick. <clears throat> the liver is shot, uh, although this is acute, so can the liver heal? Yes, the liver can heal here because this is not like cirrhosis wherein the, the liver is totally destroyed. So this one is only acute infection. It can heal. And here's the summary for your prevention for hepatitis A. Uh, let's go, well, hepatitis B is in, on another page, but uh, since this chart is here, just go ahead and finish. Uh, hepatitis B is how do we get this? 
Uh, you know what? Let's go back to this after we discuss the next page. <clears throat> so A and E are the same. A and E are both oral fecal. So same precautions. But I don't think there's a vaccine for E though. There's a vaccine for A, no vaccine for E. Okay, but both are uh, foodborne, waterborne, oral fecal route. Hepatitis B, how do you get this? Through? Okay, infected body fluids. So blood, saliva, semen, vaginal secretions all contain the virus. So therefore, how is it transmitted? Is it only through injection? No. Unprotected sexual activity as well. And also through breast milk. Uh, so it's basically same as the HIV virus. You don't know difference. Hepatitis B, same as HIV. So what's the precaution here? Uh, what do you call? We have contact, enteric, airborne, droplet, standard. This is standard precautions. Okay, so the key there is same as HIV. HIV is standard. Okay, so here are your risk factors. Those contact. Uh, by contact, we mean sexual contact or uh, open wounds, right? So exposure to uh, of uh, infected body fluids uh, into an open wound. Okay, frequent exposure. Uh, so who are frequently exposed? So these are the following. So that includes us. Statistics-wise, though, you'll be surprised. The lowest incidence of transmission is through needle sticks injuries. You may think that think that whenever you get stuck with a needle accidentally. I mean, I've been stuck at least maybe three or four times in my lifetime. I've never had, I mean, that I know of, I've never had contracted um, HIV, although I did turn positive once. No, I meant negative for all hepatitis and then HIV as well. So the the transmission rate is actually lower, okay? Because, um, I mean, is, is was there a lot of blood that was introduced to you after a needle stick injury? No, it's not like you infuse you know how many cc's right it's just a few droplets if anything right um when, when you get uh, needle stick injuries so read the rest so this will be a very nice um ngn question okay who are at risk so when you have Hepatitis B, these are your manifestations. So there will be indications of liver damage, although not permanent. Uh, prevention, of course, the best way is through. What's the best way to avoid it? Vaccines. Okay. Vaccines. <laughs> So vaccination, complete the series, make sure you're zero converted, check your um, titers. Okay. So same rule if you're traveling, for instance, or you're about to have uh, increased exposure including pre-exposure prophylaxis. So let's say you decide to go to a, uh, what do they call um, gay parties wherein they, you know, um, have multiple partners. Oh, I've heard of those. Uh, uh, Is it still called just an orgy? I think there's a specific term for that. Like a, there's a party. There's, a former student told me about it. I know orgies. It says orgies. No, there's a... Something about a <laughs> oh, bareback, bareback party. I think that's what they call it. It's not? What is bareback? Bareback is basically a heavier man. I work at a gay bar, so that's why I know these things. Yeah, what's bear the difference with what they call like men who have beards and they're like kind of like chubby? Beer or beards? Like beards. Ah, beards. Oh, so it's a different. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's supposed. I mean, they were naked with like straps, so maybe I wouldn't know. We have them at my job all the time. Oh. Uh, okay. 
So anyway, so those let's say let's look at your patrons for instance. So will there be good candidates for prophylaxis? Absolutely. Okay, very good. Okay, let's so let's go back to the previous page for prevention. So we did uh, B already. And B will be the same as C, although C has no vaccine, uh, but B does have vaccine. And hepatitis C, this will be the same if you compare it with B, exactly the same. Let's go to C. I like I already said, so B and C is the same. What's the only difference? No C has no vaccine. Let's go to D. Now, in order to get D, because look at the definition here. Hepatitis D infection occurs in some cases of hepatitis B. So therefore, can you get D alone? No, you must have had previous B infection and then you can get D. Okay, so it's impossible to get D without B first. So can you prevent vitamin, uh, I mean, hepatitis D? Yes. By how? B, taking vaccine. Okay, by being vaccinated against B, you're technically vaccinating against D. Make, uh, make sense? Okay, so it's like two in one. So you get the, complete the B series, you're now immune against both B and D. The infection is the same, so we don't have to repeat it. So as, as mentioned here, symptoms are similar. So what's the only difference? No vaccine directly for D, but there is a vaccine for B. So therefore, you're technically protecting against both. E, as we mentioned earlier, look at this here, the very short because it has, it resembles A. So same mode of transmission, same um, uh, prevention. The only difference here is probably, well, not anymore. It used to be in older editions of the textbook. E was only found in certain countries. But now because of increased travel, E and A are basically found in the same places now. There's no more distinction. Okay. Yeah, E has no vaccine. Although it is treatable, okay, you can treat it but there's no vaccine for it. C is also treatable now, uh, but still no vaccine. Very briefly, I know there is, um, there are some, anemia questions on the exam. For the specific questions on, let's say, polycythemia vera, <clears throat> I'll remove all of them for the final. But I do have the old recordings. Now, you need to do them for the NCLEX, okay? Because they're still being tested. Say polycythemia vera. Um, well, sickle cell, you're familiar with already in the past. Uh, so specifics there, since we technically did not uh, cover it in class. Uh, so just use the recordings for the NCLEX. Okay? But the questions on the exam I still will keep are the nursing responsibilities. So let's say, how do you care for patients with uh, sickle cell anemia, which is still anemia? Do you conserve energy? Do you give oxygen? All right. So those with, let's say, um, low platelet count, because in, let's say, in polycythemia vera, uh, that's a problem. Or let's say in, in uh, aplastic anemia, they all low in white, red, and, and platelets as well. So therefore, the care for those, since we discussed them already under cancer, I'll still ask them. Okay, so those questions I'll keep, right? Because they're the same concept as with cancer. Any questions? Yes.